name is Rosemary Musorewa, and I'm a clinical manager here at Homewood Health. Uh, and I would like to welcome you all uh, to this uh, webinar on inclusion and belonging in the workplace. Uh, but before we, we go on, uh, I would like us to acknowledge uh, our indigenous peoples. Uh, so whilst we meet here today at this platform, I would like to begin by acknowledging uh, the indigenous pe people of this lands. And um, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands in which we call home. Uh, we do this really to affirm uh, our commitment and responsibility in improving our understanding of local indigenous uh, peoples and their culture. From coast to coast, um, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, um, Metis and First Nations uh, communities uh, in this land that they call home. And just a little housekeeping, uh, please note that this is an, a non-interactive webinar. As such, all participants have been muted. However, please feel free to utilize the chat uh, with any questions that you may have. If we have enough time, we'll uh, get, get to them at the end of the session, or we are in fact recording this uh, webinar uh, and it will be available to you at our home website um, within the next two weeks. So the objectives um, of this uh, webinar really is to learn about workplace diversity. We want to understand the benefits that diversity along with a culture of inclusion and belonging can bring to the work, uh, workplace. I would like to develop increased awareness regarding our own attitudes uh, to the issue of diversity, equity and inclusion. I uh, would also want to identify strategies for practicing and promoting uh, inclusion and belonging in the workplace. Now there is um, this um, uh, diversity expert, uh, Deneka uh, Blackmon. Uh, she is a former dean at uh, Stanford University. And I really like the way she kind of sums up uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, she likens it to a, a dance. She says diversity is like being asked to a dance. Inclusion, on the other hand, is being asked to dance, and belonging is being able to dance whichever way you want, uh, whereas equity is having a turn in picking the DJ and probably uh, picking the music. So, but then what really is diversity? Uh, when we talk of diversity in the workplace, what does it entail? Um, the Harvard School of um, Education defines a diverse uh, workplace as one that uh, includes a broad range of characteristics. Uh, you know, people coming from different races and ethnic backgrounds, uh, uh, different sexual identities, um, gender identities that are different, economic and uh, geographical backgrounds. We can include uh, people with um, physical uh, abilities uh, and um, people who come from different uh, life experiences and educational uh, backgrounds, as well as uh, different careers uh, that they've done in the past. Uh, but we also are inclusive of uh, people who may have uh, different political dogma from us, uh, different religious uh, um, backgrounds, as well as uh, differences in personal beliefs. So it really includes uh, a diverse range of uh, characteristics that can be found in a diverse, in what we call a diverse uh, workplace. Now, um, diversity in the workplace has really been growing uh, exponentially in the past uh, few years. Um, there, is, there has been uh, various emerging phenomenon uh, around diversity. People are staying in the uh, in the workforce for prolonged periods of time, way past their um, uh, their age of retirement. Uh, we are also seeing 
um, a greater variation in uh, people coming from different uh, religious backgrounds, uh, different races and ethnicities. Um, we are also seeing very inclusive workforces uh, with people speaking different languages, uh, different gender expressions. But another interesting phenomenon that keeps coming up, uh, we are seeing highly educated people entering the job uh, with uh, a lot of uh, skill sets, uh, but then that do not really match uh, the kind of work that they are doing. So this can bring uh, a degree of uh, job dissatisfaction. Um, and um, we now have to learn to manage, um, you know, the diverse populations that we are having in the workplace. Uh, one thing that we ought to realize is having a broad range of um, uh, perspectives and skill sets can bring opportunities, but it can also bring uh, conflict depending on how we manage it. So um, various organizations are these days are really focused on keeping good employees through a commitment uh, to an engaging work environment uh, that is welcoming for people from different backgrounds uh, so that there can be job satisfaction. Uh, so nurturing those differences and um, uh, shifting the way uh, we have uh, done supervision before or the way we have managed people before is very profound. Um, for example, you know, with our younger generations that are coming into the workforce, uh, educated, they have different expectations from, uh, say, someone who has been in the on the job for 25, 30 years. Um, these young people uh, that may otherwise be very educated, uh, they are also looking at min uh, having meaningful work, uh, greater rewards uh, for their work, and an engaging workforce that really allows them uh, to be actively engaged in the decision-making processes uh, that impact uh, their jobs. Whereas with the older generation, they may be preoccupied with stability in the workforce. So change may be difficult for them, whereas the younger generation may be flexible with change. So um, managing the different needs of a diverse workforce uh, is what we are talking about. Uh, it, there is an opportunity here. We can tap into the widening views of um, a young, well-educated workforce, but we also want to retain the wisdom and the institutional knowledge uh, that you know the older uh, generation uh, brings with all the experiences. Um, that's why we are saying the role of supervision is changing and the assumptions about how work should be organized uh, is also changing. Another uh, thing to consider is when we are hiring um, people, we hire people with different personalities that really drive uh, the behaviors that we see uh, in the work workplace. Um, and this can be a source of contention, um, but when we manage uh, people with different personalities, uh, we need to know exactly uh, what their strengths are, right? Because different personalities bring different strengths and it also brings uh, different uh, weaknesses. Uh, but we can have a uh, different personalities complementing each other. For example, if you have got someone who is uh, an extrovert, uh, as we all know, extroverts, they enjoy being around people, they enjoy larger groups, uh, they thrive in workplace environments that are really geared to social interactions and cooperation and teamwork. Uh, but at the same time, a personality like that may be problematic uh, when it comes to uh, departments that really require a high degree of focus, uh, such as data analysis or maybe accounting. Uh, so on the other hand, if we have conscientious personalities, they will fit well in, uh, in, in data analysis. Extrovets may fit well in our sales and marketing department. So we can see how, um, you know, 
different personalities with the behaviors that come with those personalities can really uh, influence, uh, you know, how uh, an organization uh, is able to tap uh, into those uh, hidden resources. So you can imagine um, the five, uh, the big five personality traits, uh, we can actually come up with a lot of um, uh, those personalities, if we are to divide them, they appear on a spectrum. Uh, and if each personality trait had just a five uh, points in that uh, continu continuum, we we'll have uh, people with uh, a wide range of personalities that we also have to manage. So uh, diversity is not only good uh, for us, embracing diversity, uh, it is actually good for business. Uh, in fact, a recent study by Dixon File and uh, his colleagues, uh, it, it, this study was done in 2020 uh, and it is entitled Diversity Wins, How Inclusion Matters. Uh, they concluded that diversity is the key to success and uh, a workplace that um, a workplace thrives when there is a safe and inclusive environment for employees to share their values and traditions um, if they feel they have a sense of belonging uh, as well um, if there is increased trust uh, from management to allow employees to focus on, uh, on, on their tasks, as well as to take risks um, when they feel the need to. Uh, again, a diverse workplace can uh, thrive if there is openness to new ideas. Because remember, we talked about uh, people coming from different backgrounds, different ways of knowing. So they are bound to have uh, a, a lot of new ideas that we can, in fact, uh, tap into, and that can be reflective of the uh, outcomes that we we will end up with. So, um, again, when when we talk of uh, diversity uh, as the key to success, um, we see that diversity does bring uh, more interesting and. Uh, uh, an engaging workplace, not only does it do that, it brings to bear the multiple perspectives and ways of knowing that can lead to meaningful solutions. Uh, it also, uh, if we have diverse teams, we are bound to be more productive. Um, uh, we are bound to have higher levels of achievement. Uh, now, uh, I, I would like to acknowledge that conflict uh, is inevitable when we have a diverse group of people, uh, you know, working together. Uh, uh, but then it can also produce opportunities for creativity. And this conflict can be a source uh, for growth, you know, personal growth as well as uh, growth uh, as a team. So we must not shy away from diversity. Uh, like I said before, um, uh, a diverse workforce is actually good for business. Uh, it is good for uh, customers, our clients. Um, various studies have indeed shown, uh, examined the, this issue of diversity in the workplace uh, for several years. And uh, there is now an emerging pattern uh, which is showing us that organizations with higher gender, racial and ethnic diversity tend to be more profitable uh, than uh, their counterparts who are less diverse. Uh, for example, a recent report, Why Diversity Matters, discovered that companies that embrace racial and ethnic diversity were in fact 35% more likely to have financial re um, returns above their respective national industry medians. And that goes with gender diversity as well. Uh, companies who were in the top uh, quantile for gender diversity were 15% more likely to be profitable uh, than their uh, counterparts. So not only um, is diversity good for business, uh, we need to learn how to manage a diverse workforce. And I, I keep emphasizing um, that because really um, 
we have to go beyond just having a diverse workforce to have a workplace that is inclusive of those uh, of that diversity to have a workforce that um, uh, allows their employees to feel safe and valued right so it is not enough to just have a diverse workforce. We need to ensure that uh, everyone feels safe and valued and respected. Uh, so this brings us to the next segment uh, of our webinar, inclusion and belonging. So what then is inclusion? Uh, inclusion is about providing equal opportunities and resources, particularly to those who otherwise may be excluded or marginalized. Uh, so we know that, you know, uh, uh, equity seeking groups, uh, racialized groups, you know, uh, new immigrants, uh, uh, people from uh, different uh, sexual orientations, uh, elderly people, uh, they tend to have a really hard time in the workforce. So we want to create an environment where everyone feels uh, that they are a part of the team, that they have uh, a sense of belonging. And uh, when we talk about belonging, it's about making people feel welcome and uh, know that they are part of a group. So uh, really, I, I, I want to emphasize that um, belonging is not just about tolerating someone who you, you may not like, who is different from you. It's not about putting up uh, with something that you don't like, but it's really about understanding and valuing differences. Remember what we said in slide five, that inclusion is um, uh, uh, like being asked to a dance, but when we talk of belonging, uh, it's uh, really about being able to dance whichever way you like, because you feel that you are a part of, it, uh, of that team. So what then are the challenges uh, that we can uh, meet in a diverse uh, workforce? You know, I just want us to take a deep breath and kind of reflect and be honest with uh, yourself. I know I cannot see your, your answers right now, but I just want to ask you a question. Um, what are the challenges that one may face if a, work a, a workplace is diverse, but lacks inclusion and belonging? What are the challenges that we may face if a workplace is diverse, but lacks inclusion and belonging? Um, you know, uh, it's just something that we need to reflect on. So some of the typical challenges that we have listed here is um, if we have a diverse workforce, but uh, people don't feel included, there's bound to be misunderstandings uh, and miscommunications. Uh, a good example that comes into my mind uh, is the negativity that arises when uh, people speak uh, different languages that uh, someone may not speak or understand. Uh, that person is going to feel excluded. Uh, when people do not feel included, uh, when they don't have a sense of belonging, it, it may be difficult uh, to move forward in, in the decision-making uh, processes. Uh, we may find that it stalls uh, the decision-making process. Uh, it may create tension and limited teamwork. Uh, we may have interpersonal conflicts, uh, distrust and dislike. Uh, at the end of the day, it, uh, it, it impacts productivity uh, and we have the, those limited accomplishments. So uh, we have to manage um, our diverse workforce uh, well. Um, and we, we know that there are laws and legislations that protect uh, human rights in Canada. And uh, this, there, there are several uh, laws, in fact, uh, that govern discrimination and harassment uh, at the workforce. And being aware of those laws uh, can really be helpful. And, uh, you know, it, it is not legal to discriminate anyone based on what you are seeing on the screen, uh, whether based on race, age, gender, and so forth. Uh, it is 
against the law in Canada. So these laws are continuously evolving. Uh, most recently, uh, the House of Commons, in fact, uh, passed a legislation uh, that disallowed discrimination based on gender identification. So if someone is transgendered, you know, we want to be a welcoming uh, community and um, uh, understanding that, you know, uh, everyone matters. So we can also embrace uh, diversity, inclusion and belonging through our organizational policies. You know, when we come up with policies that influence positive outcome uh, for diversity, equity and inclusion. So we, we, we can, uh, for example, look at our hiring practices and our hiring policies. Do we uh, encourage people from different uh, backgrounds uh, to join our uh, workforce? Uh, once we become diverse, what are those workplace policies that encourage respect for, di uh, for diversity? Um, do we have anything that speaks to um, a, a safe work environment that is free from discrimination and harassment? So we have to consider uh, that uh, first at the macro level, uh, you know, through our government uh, and uh, our provincial policies, then we can do it, uh, you know, a, 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 at the meso level, which is the organizational, but we can also do it um, at the personal level, which is what we are now going into. So at the personal level, uh, respect um, for diversity does not mean you must give up your preferences. It does not mean um, that you have to change your personality or accept uh, disrespect from other people. Uh, respect simply means doing the best that you can to understand other people's perspectives and really to act um, in ways that are fair and to seek ways uh, that we can learn from others and work with um, others who may have uh, different perspectives and uh, different talents uh, from us. So I'll give you an example. If say one of your team members is not seeing things the same way that you are seeing, and um, if your coworker is kind of difficult to work with, um, respectfulness really requires you to find what it is that you can appreciate about that person and to work with them, perhaps even to work with others, with management, to seek a, a, a good resolution. You know, it, does not, it, it doesn't really mean that you have to invite someone home for dinner, uh, but respect for diversity really comes from uh, a consented uh, effort to try and understand where others are coming from. And uh, it involves um, activity from your part to first understand um, other people's perspectives, skills and challenges, and to look for opportunities uh, to be inclusive um, and to apply uh, those talents in ways that can be meaningful uh, for the team. Uh, now, social media you know we live in a very technological um time and uh, social media does play an important role in communicating you know our goals um uh, what we as we stand for uh in communicating our products uh to uh to to the broader communities uh that we serve now we want to uh know that when we use social media, are we using it in, um, in ways that is reflective of the communities that we serve, right? One of the most important thing that we ought to consider is to be aware of the subconscious biases uh, in content creation, you know. Um, uh, for example, when considering the visuals, uh, it is very important for you to uh, know that uh, images speak louder than words. We should reflect, uh, it, we should be reflective of a diverse audience, um, you know, uh, different ethnicities, genders, uh, uh, ages, abilities, 
Um, now, I, I just want to share a, a, a personal story that happened to me some years ago. I, I attended uh, a workshop on human trafficking uh, and the presenter for that workshop was um, uh, a police officer. He has worked in human trafficking tirelessly and rescued uh, a lot of um, um, you know, young women. A very uh, profound work that he did. Um, but we are talking about unconscious biases, right? So um, it was a very large workshop. Uh, we were over 200, uh, but not as diverse. Uh, I, I could count, uh, it was the two of us um, who were uh, visible minorities or black women. So uh, the PowerPoint presentation was uh, brilliant. He did a good job uh, in, you know, explaining uh, the process uh, that happens uh, when they are taking these young girls and are modeling them uh, for human trafficking. But what caught my eye as he was going through the PowerPoint presentation, all the pictures that we were shown of the Johns, uh, of the pimps, of very aggressive men that were hitting these young girls, they were all pictures of um, young black men as well as middle-aged uh, black men. Not a single picture was uh, of another culture, you know, whether Chinese or uh, white or... So I kept saying to myself, is what I'm saying right? Um, I kept hoping, <laughs> you know, uh, that the PowerPoint could be more inclusive, but no, up to the end, um, or the women as well that were being um, trafficked, uh, the, ref the pictures that were being shown were of young white women. And I began to wonder, uh, you know, are there any other races uh, that are trafficked as well? Are there any other races uh, that are violent towards women? So those are the questions I ended up asking. Um, and being uh, the only person in a sea of, um, you know, uh, uh, white people, I was triggered, but if, and, uh, other people were not triggered. So just ensuring that your content is appropriate for diverse audiences. Some messages can trigger an emotional response for one group, but not for the other group. So there is really need to research on what it is that you plan to share and how appropriate is it. Um, uh, we need to use neutral language and neutral tone um, so that, you know, people are not coming out of that workshop or uh, viewing our content with subliminal messages that say, uh, you know, young black men and middle-aged black men are extremely uh, violent uh, to young white women. You know, that is the message that was uh, put there. And when I asked, he was surprised because for him, it, it, it was uh, at the subconscious level. Uh, it was not meant to be like that. Um, I, I don't blame him by any uh, shape or any means. Uh, but it's something uh, that happens and uh, something that we ought to be aware of. So let's look, for instance, uh, at this um, picture. I just want us to, to reflect a little bit. Uh, when you look at this picture uh, that you are seeing on your screen, which groups have been excluded from this picture? And which group is overrepresented? in this picture, right? So do you think that um, for older people, is this picture going to be appealing to them? Do you think for people living with disabilities, is this picture going to be appealing to them? It's an otherwise very good picture to use. Uh, you know, for our promotional videos or whatever, but we have to think about how inclusive we are. 
uh, towards uh, the diverse communities that we serve, even towards our uh, organizations. So the golden rule that we were told uh, growing up is that treat others as you would have them treat you. But now we are moving uh, really to the platinum, platinum rule that says treat others the way they would like to be treated. So it's not about how you want to be treated, but it's about really reflecting and saying, how do that person uh, like to be treated? And how do you know that? By opening up and getting to know our people. So we gave you a handout. Uh, one of the things that we, um, we, 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 we do is that, you know, when we are ce celebrating things like Christmas, Easter, we forget that not everybody um, celebrates those holidays. So uh, just educating ourselves and saying, hey, what do other people celebrate? Uh, what is it that matter to them in the workplace? And maybe having a culture of saying, hey guys, uh, what is it that you celebrate so that we can celebrate uh, with you, it, it can just be sending an email, uh, happy Hanukkah or something like that. Uh, but really it makes people feel uh, rather included. So uh, the uh, calendar of holidays or festivities that we send you, we sent you, it is by no means exhaustive. Uh, it is not in depth, but we can start a conversation you know, in your communities uh, to see those organizations uh, that celebrate these holidays and to really find out what are they all about uh, and to surprise each other in the workplace. We cannot talk about diversity, inclusion and belonging without talking about microaggressions. Uh, microaggressions are really offenses, insults uh, and inclusion in exclusions uh, that may seem minor to the perpetrator, but uh, they are often hateful and offensive uh, to the receiver. So microaggressions are often committed um, unconsciously without intending any harm uh, or without even realizing that you are causing uh, harm to other people. Um, this can reflect uh, hidden power imbalances and power plays. They often appear in the form of a compliment, you know, a joke, uh, uh, being sarcastic. Uh, microaggressions stem from those unconscious biases uh, that sometimes we do not know we have. And um, we will talk about that this a little bit uh, more. So the unconscious uh, bias is uh, having a predisposition or prejudice uh, that you are not aware of. Often our intention is not to be biased uh, or to make biased decisions, um, but our conscious mind, you know, we can only handle uh, very few information, uh, uh, most of the information that we make reference to uh, is retrieved from uh, our huge data bank, which is our um, uh, subconscious mind, right? Uh, the subconscious mind uh, it can process 11 million pieces of information, whereas our conscious mind can only uh, process maybe 40 or 50 pieces of information. So our subconscious mind is very powerful. Uh, it stores our beliefs, our, um, our values, uh, our previous experiences, our memories, our skill sets. Um, it, it, it really stores, um, you know, uh, those early life experiences, early socialization uh, that we got from our primary agents of socialization, which is our family, um, our, our mom and dad, uh, as well as, you know, our caregivers. Uh, therefore, based on what it is that is stored in our data bank, which is the subconscious mind, we have this natural tendency to place people in uh, categories or in hierarchies. 
these unconscious biases um, stemming from certain uh, neural patterns, you know, uh, that were formed uh, uh, through, um, you know, our families or through our backgrounds and social identities um, and cultural norms and values will influence how we make decisions in the workplace. So I'll give you an example. Even members uh, of uh, marginalized groups like women can harbor unconscious biases towards their own. So uh, suppose I am a, a, a recruiter who is a woman, uh, I still have those biases that uh, we, we grew up uh, being told, you know, that men are um, are courageous, uh, they are independent, uh, they are natural leaders, and they are assertive. So that can prime the way I see applicants and the way I may end up favoring male applicants over my fellow uh, women. So this has got nothing to do with uh, their experiences or their educational background. In fact, uh, research tells us that um, women are more likely to have um, in a, a, a degree, a, a college degree than men. But if you see uh, the world that we, we live in is still very patriarchal. We see um, uh, more men holding uh, positions of power and higher authorities, uh, and we never really stop to question our hiring practices and how those unconscious biases uh, can in fact influence how we do those hiring. Uh, now, I'm going to give you a few examples of the unconscious biases and how they can impact um, the, the workforce. So if you look, um, uh, these are various uh, unconscious or implicit biases, they do hinder diversity, inclusion and belonging in the workplace. Uh, these are by no means exhaustive. They, uh, in fact, it is believed that there are over 150 types of biases, but um, I'll just look at a few. Uh, affinity bias, uh, there is that tendency in us to favor people who remind us of ourselves of, or of our friends. Uh, and uh, for example, when hiring someone, we may hire someone because they remind us of uh, our friend or family member. Confirmation bias, it is uh, interpreting or remembering only the things that confirms our pre-existing beliefs. Um, another one that is uh, profound is the hollow effect, uh, liking something about a person and assuming uh, that therefore everything about them must be uh, good. Uh, for example, a teacher may believe that because a student is well-mannered, is well-behaved, therefore they must be smart. Uh, but another uh, uh, bias that is really, um, sorry, I meant to, uh, the perception bias. Uh, forming an opinion about someone based on the group that they belong to, and that has to do with stereotyping. Um, I experienced a lot of that uh, with my children um, as they were going through, you know, uh, high school. I was told time and time again that they should not uh, do academic subjects. Uh, because they will not be able to make it for university. Uh, now, for me, being a social worker and uh, being good at advocates, I had to go to the principal's office time and time again and refusing that label on my children. Uh, because, because of those unconscious biases, teachers will associate color with uh, lack of ability. Uh, they may also associate having an accent uh, with dumbness. Uh, so, but I, I, I declined, I said, no, my children are going to university. There is absolutely nothing wrong with them. Uh, but anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, uh, both my girls, one is a nurse, the other one is in med school. Uh, and uh, the, the little one is going to be a social worker like mommy. So, um, but those are 
subconscious biases uh, that may influ that may really uh, store someone's career. Uh, you know, uh, it can impact have a, a huge impact on a child from a racialized group. Uh, it can uh, store our ability uh, to to be promoted. You know, when we do those um, uh, 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 the what do you call it? I'm forgetting. When we do the appraisals, that's what I wanted to say. When we do the appraisals, we need to be in check with ourselves to make sure that uh, we are not having underlying biases uh, that may stop um, some people from uh, climbing the ladder. So the impact of unconscious biases, I've kind of alluded to them already. They um, they influence every uh, a lot of aspects within uh, the workforce, be it recruitment, uh, performance reviews, uh, the way we mentor uh, other people. So I like uh, this author, uh, uh, Derald uh, Wingsu. Um, he believes that individuals who are openly biased are actually less threatening than those with hidden biases. In one of his quotes, he said, overt racists are le less likely to affect the standard of my living than individuals who are well-intentioned. Uh, they can be educators, employers, healthcare uh, providers. They are well-intentioned, but they are unaware of their biases. And uh, Cindy Blackstock uh, is also another researcher on First Nation, uh, First Nation communities. And she really talks about generational trauma and how unconscious biases uh, drove indigenous people, uh, indigenous children into the welfare system uh, during the 60s scope. And it continued even after the 60s scope. Uh, she actually noted that social workers who removed those children from um, indigenous um, family, from their indigenous families, they were well-meaning. They thought that they were rescuing the children uh, from their parents, but they had good intentions. But hey, good intentions are not good enough. So that's what Cindy Blackster is saying, that good intentions are not good enough. That's why we have to go constantly on that journey of self-reflection, uh, self-reflexivity, uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, the work that we do, we are not uh, allowing those unconscious biases to cloud our day-to-day uh, activities um, or, you know, our decisions in the recruitment process, in performance uh, reviews, uh, and uh, in our job assignments. So another reflection that I want us to, uh, uh, to think about, you know, when we uh, become more aware that uh, when we question our own reality uh, and become aware that, hey, I never thought about it, but there may be uh, some unconscious biases that I may harbor because of uh, where I come from, because of my background, because of my culture, because um, of my, 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 my life experiences. So let's say, for instance, I just want you to imagine, take a deep breath, and imagine, picture a financial, uh, the financial sector CEO. What image comes to your mind? You know, what gender is that CEO? What race is that CEO? What sexual orientation is the CEO of a big uh, financing organization? Uh, when you think. Uh, when you are invited to dinner by somebody, uh, your, your colleague, what is the structure of the family that you imagine? When someone is arrested for violent crime, what does that person look like? What does that person look like? Uh, the hero in a story, what does that hero look like? You know? If you are to write answers to those questions uh, and later look at your answers and reflect them, you will see a lot of our answers uh, will have those underlying uh, nuances and um, 
driving uh, unconscious biases. Uh, we will associate a CEO of a large organization with uh, a middle-aged uh, white man. We will associate, um, you know, a family from, um, uh, you know, a nucleus family. Uh, we, we won't think of blended families. We won't think of uh, same-sex uh, parents. Uh, we will think of a hero as uh, a man who is muscular and things like that. So all of us, we have uh, these biases and we bring them uh, into the workforce. We therefore have to be um, aware of them uh, so that we can be more inclusive. So become aware of your own uh, unconscious biases and reflect on your own assumptions uh, around things like race, gender, and education. Um, you have to try and observe uh, and define the competencies that other people bring to the workforce. Uh, and you, you have to be prepared to acknowledge uh, their strengths and their skill sets, you know. Um, where someone has a life experience that is difficult uh, to understand and that causes you uh, uncertainty. It's not okay to just say, I'm afraid of this person without um, you know, taking that approach of, I want to learn more about this person. Taking a learning approach really um, means that we are able to investigate uh, what they like, uh, we are able to uh, simply maybe ask the person that helped me understand um, your, your circumstances or your experiences, uh, your background. Um, most of the people are really happy to share their stories uh, as much as they want and as little as they want. Uh, take every opportunity uh, to understand the competencies that surround us all the time in the workplace, uh, the competencies that diverse talents, uh, diverse people uh, bring onto the table, right? Um, it, it's really important uh, that we acknowledge that. Uh, where you feel a distance or a potential conflict uh, with somebody's behavior, um, it's really important to invite them maybe for coffee or uh, invite them for a walk um, and not talk about uh, work, but just talk about life in general. You will be surprised by how the moment you begin to know more about a person, uh, you that may impact uh, how you feel them. You know, someone whom you may have thought uh, is confrontational uh, may actually uh, be helping others to see a bigger picture. So uh, like we said before, uh, conflict in a diverse workplace is inevitable. What if you offend someone? What do you do? You know, we can expect that offense uh, in all likelihood, um, we, we will offend someone. Uh, a study conducted by the Ohio State University uh, identifies uh, six components to an effective apology. Uh, when you are apologizing, you need to acknowledge uh, your responsibility, offer to repair the issue you are apologizing for, express regret, you know, uh, a genuine regret, explain what went wrong, you know, uh, to cause this conflict, and repent uh, for that problem, request for forgiveness, and you focus on what could make it better next time. Uh, so we do not want to go into this deflated kind of apology. I'm sorry, but the moment you put a but after you're sorry, then you are not sorry. I'm sorry I offended, uh, uh, if I offended you. So you, you are not accepting that you offended someone. You are saying, if, as if, you know, mm, I don't think I offended you, but if I, you know, so um, I'm sorry if I feel that way. Again, we are putting it on the other person. So true apology is um, being able to say, I am sorry, I, should, I shouldn't have done A, B, C, D. I'm sorry that I offended you. I'm sorry the story that I told 
uh, really made you feel that way. And I am now realizing that I shouldn't have done that. So very important. Um, then another issue is what if we have been offended? You know, it's not just us offending other people, but it could be us being offended. Uh, one thing that you shouldn't do is not to say anything, uh, because when we do that, we can harbor resentment, uh, anger. And for me as a therapist, really, it's not good for your health uh, because those stress levels will impact you. You'll start feeling, you know, tightness of the chest, you know, pain in your neck and things like that, uh, because you are ruminating and catastrophizing over something that you may have uh, been able to talk through. So not saying anything to the offender as well, but then saying everything else to everybody uh, is not good. It only uh, exacerbates uh, a small issue can become a, a mountain. Um, is, uh, also confronting in the heat of the moment, uh, confronting someone uh, may also escalate the situation. So what do we do when we feel that we have been offended? Um, one of the things that we must do is let's stick to facts, uh, you know, uh, and not blow things out of proportion or over exaggerate. Let's share specific facts about the situation, uh, who it included, when it happened, how it happened, um, you know, where it took place. Uh, and then let's express our feelings uh, using the I statement. I felt dismissed. I felt invalidated. I felt invisible when we were in that meeting and I, I was not acknowledged. And then uh, tell them how you would want things to go in the future. I would appreciate it if you allow me to say something during the meeting, right? So that's how we can, um, uh, you know, uh, be more inclusive. So um, ideas for workplace uh, action. Let's look, of, uh, uh, look at how we can achieve a successfully diverse uh, workplace. Um, we need to ensure uh, awareness of organizational policies that um, respect uh, people and that are uh, uh, really talks about discrimination, anti-discriminatory policies. Uh, we need to understand why diversity in the workplace um, uh, is good for business and we need to strengthen it uh, so that, you know, we can, um, uh, everyone can feel more um, included and have a sense of belonging. We need to create group opportunities for learning uh, like evaluation-based uh, team development, uh, conflict resolution, learning how do we do uh, conflict uh, resolution, uh, you know, just getting together, whether we do potlucks, uh, whether we, uh, we, we find ways in uh, creating that uh, cohesion, that togetherness, uh, and talking about what it is that we want to see happening in our workplace. Uh, uh, what kind of behaviors uh, is, do we like to see? Uh, is it civility? Is it professionalism? Is it togetherness? Is it respect? Uh, so really coming up uh, with a positive uh, group experiences and showcasing those uh, rich uh, experiences uh, together can be profound. So a workplace culture uh, that supports inclusion and belonging will look like uh, a place where someone, where, where everybody uh, within the workplace feels, um, have, has a sense of belonging, uh, where leaders are leading by empathy and understanding, um, where we are committed at all levels of the organization uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, whereby you know, we, we, we want to make sure that um, we consider uh, everyone, you know, whether it be it in meetings, um, are we leaving anybody out? Um, are we being more inclusive? Uh, what are those ongoing efforts that we are doing uh, to make sure that uh, we remain successful 
in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So uh, in conclusion, I would like to say uh, individuals and their organizations um, are really responsible for practicing and promoting diversity, inclusion, and belonging within the workforce. Um, becoming aware of our own biases is really the first step uh, that we can take towards addressing um, you know, uh, lack of uh, inclusion or lack of belonging. Do your best to understand uh, other people, uh, to act in ways that are fair, and to seek ways, you know, uh, that you can get to know uh, other people's perspectives and learn about their cultures, about uh, their values uh, and their beliefs. Uh, so that, you know, we can work in this diverse um, uh, workplace uh, that honors uh, different ways of knowing, different skill sets uh, and different talents. Um, again, higher levels of group achievements, uh, like we said, can be ex expected uh, when we are more inclusive and uh, when the work of everyone has a sense of belonging. Uh, but above all, it is good for business. When we reflect uh, the, the communities uh, that we serve, um, it starts with us as an organization. Are we reflective of our clients? Are we reflective um, of the people that we serve? Um, and how are we handling each other internally so that we can handle uh, those that we serve in a better and more meaningful way? There, is, there will never uh, uh, be in the world two opinions that are alike, no more than two hairs or two grains uh, that are alike, but the most universal quality of them all is diversity. And beyond that, it is inclusion and belonging. So uh, thank you everybody uh, for listening. Uh, I know I had uh, some technical difficulties uh, in the big, uh, 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 at the start, uh, but I really uh, would love to see all your comments. We are left with um, a few minutes, um, but um, this uh, webinar will be posted um, uh, on the, uh, on our website uh, in the in a week or so, uh, but just also a reminder: uh, we are working with um, uh, with Health Canada uh, in, in wellness together. Uh, we are in partnership with them so that we provide mental health uh, services. Uh, to all Canadians, we know that we are really living in difficult times with um, uh, with COVID virus, and some people or friends that you may know may have lost uh, their jobs. So Wellness Canada is there for anybody who may not have um, um, coverage, and would love to see you come. Uh, but thank you very much, and um, if you want to get hold of us, uh, this is our uh, contact. Um, I'm just looking at some of the, I'm not seeing a question so far in the chats. Uh, so thank you everybody and uh, it was nice to see you and I uh, hope we will uh, talk some more uh, another time. Thank you. Thank you.